Ladies and gentlemen, the 4th Infantry Division Band. Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, as uh, folks are taking their seats, uh, just a reminder for this particular ceremony, it is, uh, you know, you need to mute your devices again. Same, same. Uh, there is no covers, so you can put your covers away. Uh, so no saluting required for that. Any questions? Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, the men and women of the North American Aerospace Defense Command, the United States Northern Command. In keeping with one of the oldest traditions in military service, pay special tribute to Sergeant Major James K. Porterfield on the occasion of his retirement. The presiding officer for today's ceremony is Lieutenant General Mark R. Wise, United States Marine Corps, retired. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please stand for the arrival of the official party and presentation of the colors, playing of the national anthem, and the invocation. Present the colors. Greetings, everyone. Uh, it's great to be back with the Northcom and NORAD family. Today marks two weeks of retirement for me. And so thank you, my friend, for this opportunity. And when I woke up on June 1st, the first day of my retirement, I reflected on this, that retirement points in two directions. It points to the past and the great relationships, great people, great memories, but it also points to the future and the opportunities and God's plan for your life. So with that in mind, let's pray. Dear Father, it's such an honor to be a part of this ceremony as we celebrate 
Sergeant Major Porterfield and his 36 years of faithful service in support of this great nation and the cause of freedom. Only you know the true impact James has had over the years. He has truly represented the core, but much more than that, he has represented your kingdom, and your kingdom has no end. Yes, he's retiring from uniform service, but not from life. This new phase of life will present some challenges, a challenge to be flexible in the midst of unknown variables, and perhaps most difficult, a challenge to slow down and enjoy life a bit more. Lord, give him your peace and your joy in the quietness. We thank you for Karen and their sons, Calvin, Gary, Jonathan, and Andre. Give them your strength and grace as all together they step into this new endeavor. And of course, we ask a special blessing for their extended family, that they may grow together and their bonds strengthen as the years go by. We know that you have a good and perfect plan for them, and it's our prayer that they clearly see it, obey it, and follow your path. We thank you for being with them every step of their journey, and we know you will continue to be with them in their future. Your word promises that you preserve our going out and our coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Thank you for your constant presence and your care for each of us, no matter where we go and what we do. We pray now your blessings on this ceremony and all who are attending, and we pray that you keep our service members strong and vigilant as they guard the frontiers of freedom around the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be seated. Well, thanks again to the 4th Infantry Division Band for the beautiful rendition of the National Anthem. And Lieutenant General Roper, thank you for those inspirational words. We are honored to have a number of distinguished guests with us today. Please hold your applause until all have been introduced. General Gregory Guillo, Commander, North American Aerospace Defense Command, the United States Northern Command, and his spouse, Carolyn. Mrs. Terry Wise, spouse of Lieutenant General, retired, Mark Wise. Mrs. Karen Porterfield, spouse of Sergeant Major James Porterfield. Sergeant Major Porterfield's sons, Staff Sergeant Calvin Albright and Jonathan Albright. Sergeant Major Porterfield's brother, Senior Airman John Porterfield and his spouse, Jennifer. Commodore Raymond King, Commander, Royal Bahamas Defense Force and a Senior Enlisted Leader, Force Chief Petty Officer Vaughn Ferguson. Master Sergeant Geraldo Alvarado Flores, Senior Enlisted Leader to the Mexican Army Commander. Chief Petty Officer Marco Antonio Pachero Lorenzo, Senior Enlisted Leader to the Mexican Marine Corps Commandant. Lieutenant General Dimitri Henry, Director for Intelligence, Joint Staff. Lieutenant General Blaise Frawley, Deputy Commander, North American Aerospace Defense Command. Lieutenant General Thomas Carden, Deputy Commander, United States Northern Command, and his spouse, Charlene. Lieutenant General A.C. Roper, United States Army, retired, and his spouse, Edith. SEAC Troy Black, Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Sergeant Major Carlos Ruiz, Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. Chief Master Sergeant David Flossi, Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. Senior Enlisted Advisor Tony Whitehead, the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chief of the National Guard Bureau. Chief Master Sergeant John G. Storms, Command Senior Enlisted Leader, NORAD in U.S. Northcom and his spouse, Carrie. And to the many aunts, uncles, cousins, and dear friends, we welcome you all. Thank you for attending today's ceremony. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, you may have noticed the empty chair on the stage. This is to honor our fallen servicemen and women who could not be with us here today. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce the presiding official for today's ceremony, Lieutenant General Mark Wise, United States Marine Corps, retired.
Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am so excited to be here. I know most of you are too, all of you probably. But uh, I want to start with a couple of thank yous. Uh, and I am a wanderer, so I keep you on your toes a little bit. But uh, the first thank you is to you, Sergeant Major. Sergeant Major Porterfield, as with any of us when we retire after a very long and distinguished career, we have the choice of inviting whoever we want because it's our ceremony in order to retire us. Uh, and that honor is not lost on me. And I am very grateful that I get this opportunity to share this with you, Terry and I both do. So thank you. Um, I want to say another thank you as well. And that's to Karen, Casey, uh, Calvin and John, and I believe we have on the uh, stream, uh, we have Gary and Andre as well. So to all of you, I want to I wanna pause for this thank you, because this is about family. And for me, I think all of us realize how important our families are, to, especially when you stay for a very long career and all the sacrifices they make. But we don't necessarily focus on how many of those sacrifices they are, especially when we're deployed all the time or we're working long hours. It always seems that, you know, they're keeping the home front going, but that is, is so, such a gross understatement. It's when, every, when something's going to break, it's going to break as soon as your service member leaves to go do the job he needs to do. And when it breaks, you still got to raise kids, you got to maintain the house, and you get no breaks. And that is extraordinary. It really is. And so the thank you for your service, all of you, uh, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. That is an incredible thing you have done. If we could give them a round of applause real quick. Okay, we have a ton of Marine Corps legends out here. And sir, if you'd permit me, I'm just gonna say thank you to everyone who, uh, uh, that we already announced that uh, is here today in part of this uh, ceremony, but we have some extraordinary legends back there. I'm not going to go through any of the names, so you're safe, uh, but all of you showing up for Sergeant Major Porterfield's retirement, I know it means the world to him, and that's fantastic, so thank you for being here. Okay, how do you encapsulate 36 years in about 10 to 15 minutes? You don't, right? And I am not going to read a bio, never was, but his bio is in the program, and I highly recommend you take a look at it because it is extraordinary, and I don't use that word lightly. It's incredible. I am going to talk about it from the perspective of perspective, right? It's about inspiration, and specifically inspirational leadership. It's about a strong moral compass, and it's about compassion. Those things, in my mind, define this extraordinary Sergeant Major right here uh, that has been my friend for not as long as some of these people, but for a long time. And, uh, and he is, we're going to go over a few things that he's done, but what I want to talk to is put each of those things in perspective for what he's accomplished in his career, okay? So if you start, uh, his career started in aviation, which was mentioned during the, uh, the turnover. And he was a avionics technician uh, within the Aviate B Harrier. And the important piece of this that I want to bring out is each of us, when we start a career, we hope that we have the chance to be led by somebody who inspires us to be better. Doesn't put us down anywhere, brings us up to their level and inspires us to be the very best we can be. And I would say that probably started with your dad because his dad was also an avionics Marine right? And that's where his love of aviation began before he started his career. If you fast forward to when he actually reported to his first unit, uh, it was uh, Corporal Roland, I believe. Uh, and we talked about this. He was that leader that knew everything about the airplane, everything. So when somebody couldn't figure out how to fix something and they had exhausted all opportunities, they went to Corporal Roland. That was his start, and he was the type of Marine that took that on board as, I want to be that Marine, and in doing so, became that Marine. Because if you go throughout his aviation uh, experience, and for the Marine Corps, that goes up through about gunnery sergeant, depending on your pathway, uh, he was and became 
that Marine that everyone went to because he was the one that knew the system's cold. He's the one that inspired everyone to come up to his level. And that's pretty cool. That's like very cool. So you go beyond that. And he did some time on the drill field, as you're aware. Now remember, I said inspiration, I said strong moral compass, and I said compassion. I am relatively certain that those first recruits that met Sergeant Porterfield on the drill field probably used none of those three in describing him. Maybe in time, if they stayed around him long enough, they absolutely would have used those uh, because they do describe this incredible man's career. But throughout that, the important part to note in all of his time as a drill instructor, senior drill instructor, chief drill instructor, as an instructor at the DI school, if you talk to him about it, it's all about bringing others up to a level. It's not about being better than that guy. It's about making us both better because you're so good already. Because those are the cream of the crop. Those are the very best that we bring together to influence and give our new Marines their beginning. So that was another part of his experience. And then, as most of our services go, when you hit about E7, for us as a gunnery sergeant, you pick one path. Well, the Marine Corps helps you pick that path, right? Uh, and that path is either you go into a specialty path or you go into a general leadership path, which takes you through first sergeant and sergeant major. And for Sergeant Major Porterfield, as he became a first sergeant, he was assigned to the first light armor Recon reconnaissance battalion. And the important piece of this is he shows up in January and they're deploying by April. So you've got a background in aviation, you have to learn a new system, you have to learn to be a vehicle commander, and you're a first sergeant for a company, you gotta learn all the, those uh, Marines as well because they've got to be taken care of. you got to do all those things, and you have to inspire those Marines along the way. And so he deploys a few months later, and he's right in the thick of it in the first push into Fallujah. And he is operating that vehicle as a vehicle commander and gets into some pretty nasty firefights, as we've talked about. And there are those in this crowd that know exactly all the detail to those firefights. But then your main gun jams. And now you gotta add the intestinal fortitude to get out, unjam that gun, and get back in the fight. That's the kind of inspiration that he is used to day to day. And then later on, getting into IED fields and trying to get back out again and get all of his Marines out with him. Those are the kinds of high pressure inspiration that Sergeant Major Porterfield had become routine in his career. Though I would tell you they're anything but routine when you start talking about the the impact they had. As he became a Sergeant Major, he went to the 1st Recon Battalion. Uh, and there are some here that know exactly uh, that entire uh, story, but I'm only gonna hit a small piece of it. They go and deploy again, only this time to OEF in Afghanistan. They're in, doing a night insert into Sangin, which is uh, just northeast of Marja. Uh, and they get into a pretty nasty firefight right away. And as I, uh, discussed this with uh, some of the folks that have been out there. This was a pretty young battalion. However, a very capable battalion. And so you're leading in a major firefight for a unit that has no forward operating base because that is not how recon operates. They are always in the terrain. That is their operating space. And so they are relieving a unit, or they are trying to provide support to a unit uh, that is taking heavy casualties. And so he's got to be there for his Marines through all these casualties and still continue the fight. And that kind of pressure is hard to describe. And he would tell you that he was inspired by the skill and capability of all of his Marines but I would probably say that all of his Marines would talk about the skill and capability of an extraordinary leader, big time. And then when he thought that's, that's what his destiny is, somebody here, or used to be here, said, hey, actually they are here, Sergeant Major Carter, uh, said, hey, you need to go to a recruiting station. And if you think recruiting is a cakewalk, it doesn't matter what service you're in, right? Army, Air Force, Marines, Navy, does not matter. It is difficult. It is high pressure all the time. 
So if you're a sergeant major there and you have to lead Marines that are under intense pressure constantly, it's just a different kind of pressure. And he excels there too. And then it turns out I get to serve with him out at 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing. Now that seems like it might be a cakewalk, right? Well, uh, probably not in this particular case. There were some readiness issues. It had to do with not anybody's fault. It had to do with resourcing and a few other things. But the key point is there was an intense amount of pressure on the command deck because we had already charted exactly what needed to be done to change that readiness curve. Very confidently, the command team. But when you do that, it takes constant interaction with your Marines to ensure that you're changing that curve, changing habit patterns, changing the way they do business, while a command area is putting an intense pressure and telling you almost daily you're going to fail because they were getting some bad information, not their fault. Telling you you're going to fail and when you do, you're going to get replaced. Why is this important? Because when you're administering that change and you have to shield all of your Marines from that other negative intensity and keep them on the right track, that dials up the pressure in a big way. So, inspiration across many different kinds of pressure and intensity, always there and always impressive. And I will always be grateful for how impressive that was and you. The two other things I said were strong moral compass. All of those examples I just gave you, all of them require you to make hard decisions quickly and they have to be the right decisions morally. And not only do you do that, but you've got to make sure that your Marines know that is the way you operate because that will be the foundation by which you operate for the rest of your life. Strong moral compass provides that for them. Compassion. Each of those examples talks about intense pressure, intense pressure from different directions. So taking care of those Marines, making sure they have what they need, making sure their families are taken care of with an amazing command team. That's also extraordinary. And that sounds like an overused word, but the fact is it fits every single time. So I'm going to, I'm going to finish right where I started. And I'm going to say that thank you for your service. Thank you for your sacrifice. And thank you, thank you, thank you for your inspiration. Because I will always be grateful and I will always count myself as one. So with the last 36 years where any indication of where this Marine's going, it's going to be pretty amazing to watch. And I'm looking forward to being part of it. But before we get to that, Sergeant Major Rees, could I ask you to come up for a few minutes? Thank you, John. Appreciate you. Sir. Don't be nervous, James. <laughs> Look, don't be scared. It's going to be okay, James. Just <laughs> a couple of months ago, a couple of months ago, we went to a retirement ceremony. Yeah, and uh, in that ceremony. In the Marine Corps process, the letters get read, right? Letters get read, and then a letter from the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. And it was at the same time. We both were sitting, uh, you know, a good 10 people apart, and we both leaned forward. We looked at each other, and you said, aren't you here? <laughs> and I was going to say, I'm right here. Like, and so why, this is why I'm here. This is part of why I'm here because in that after moment, we said, hey, when it's time for you to retire, first of all, it would be weird to read my own letter, right? So I'm not going to do that, but it would be good. It would be nice, James, if I could just, because that letter won't do any justice to the 36 years. It just is woefully insufficient. I mean... I think I'm your, I'm the 10th Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps that you lived through. You are old. <laughs> You're so old. But he looks so good. He looks like you haven't aged. 
I, I do want to step back a little bit. Every retired sergeant major that came to come see this legend retire, can you please stand up? Can we give them an... <laughs> Thank you. See, that crew, Sergeant Major Black, Sergeant Major Porterfield, that's, that may be like a Friday afternoon for you, but for me, that crew is terrifying. Like legends, General, who want nothing from you. They want nothing of you. They want nothing from you. All they want all they wanted was to get here and have the opportunity to say thank you and shake your hand and receive you into this new formation of legends, this pantheon of legends that you're stepping into. That's, that's just incredible for me to watch these people come and receive you. And you're in your alphas already, so you already know you're squared away that you can check in into that formation immediately. And so I, I just wanted to pause and, and, and stay there in order to transition to this. You chose to have your retirement here, okay? And we respected that, right? But speaking as the 20th, I want you to know that if you would have said, I want to have it home, if you would have said, uh, I want to come home. I want you to picture a field of thousands of Marines, formations of the willing, all with the same intent that they have, which is just an opportunity to say thank you for paving such an incredible path. And so that that choice that you made, what they did instead is they sent me to represent the almost 200,000 active and reserve Marines. I am their messenger. And James Porterfield, you did it right. You did it for a long time. And my God, did you elevate the standard. It was a privilege for me, the one personal thing that I will say here, to watch you in rooms where commanders, executives, no matter who was in the room, when that little voice in your head for every senior enlisted leader comes on, this is when you speak. This is when you say something. Everyone knows it, right? And everyone in that room is expecting you to say it. I knew every time that it would be you, that you would be the one. Anybody have any concerns with this? Well, actually, sir, and you would deliver from a place of strength that I'd never seen before, that I wanted to emulate, that when I saw you deliver a compelling case for why this was a good or a bad idea, people listened in the room, and you changed the room every time. And I've taken that with me, and I've tried to convey that now to the future generations that will take your place, my place. And I want you to know that although you've been away for a few years from your home, that if we were to go today to Range 400 in Tony Nam Palms, California, where it's a sunny 115 beautiful degrees, there are Marines today who have their cami paint just smearing off their faces who are still carrying the heavy loads, who are still wearing the shredded camis from the rocks, and who will do it over and over and over again. Why? Because you have let them there, and they continue to do that today. So why do we have a celebration like this? Because it is the Marine Corps' way to pause. We paused. Nothing moves. Nothing happens because we will pause and honor a legend who's about to step off. And we take the time to say to Karen and the children that you've been riding this train, this bullet train for a long time. 
And now it's time for the train to stop. Everyone acknowledges, says their thank yous, and we hope that you stay connected. And then everyone gets off the train, except you, Staff Sergeant, you stay on the train. <laughs> You're staying on the train. <laughs> and he continues on because you made it better than how you found it. So what will you do tomorrow? Tomorrow morning, you will wake up. And for the first time in your adult life, you, will, you do not have to put on a uniform. What would that feel like? What would, the, what would that be like? But there's 200,000 Marines who will wake up tomorrow and they will put on our cloth. What they don't know is that it's threaded, internally threaded with you. And because of you, 200,000 plus Marines will wake up, put on a uniform, and be a little better, a little stronger, a little faster, and they will deliver. And you will watch it from far away, and you will make, you, make your eyes water. So this institution did not make you rich, but holy crap, you have 35, 36 years of memories that you get to take with you. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to say a few things from the institution over to you and from the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And me, we love you and Semper Fi, brother. Hoorah. Thank you very much, General. Thank you very much, Sergeant Major. The ten General Wise, Sergeant Major Porterfield, please take center stage. The certificate of retirement from the Armed Forces of the United States of America. To all who shall see these presents, greeting. This is to certify that Sergeant Major James K. Porterfield having served faithfully and honorably, was retired from the United States Marine Corps on the first day of November, 2024. Signed, Eric M. Smith, General, United States Marine Corps, Commandant of the Marine Corps. Sergeant Major Porterfield, we are pleased to present you with the following certificate of appreciation from the 46th President of the United States, Joseph R. Biden, Jr. It reads, I extend my personal gratitude and sincere appreciation of a grateful nation to you for your patriotic service to our country. Your bravery and dedication in our armed forces helped protect our fellow Americans during a critical moment in our history and contributed to a world of greater security and growing prosperity. Your devotion to duty, honor, and country, in keeping with the long traditions of the finest military in the world, embodied the American ideal of selfless service. Our nation owes you an incredible debt. Your commitment and the example you set will inspire future generations to serve with pride and to keep our country secure. You represent the best of our nation, and I join our fellow Americans in saluting your honorable service. I wish you happiness and success in your next chapter. Signed, Joseph R. Biden, Commander-in-Chief. Sergeant Major Porterfield also received a letter from General Eric M. Smith, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, and it reads, Dear Sergeant Major Porterfield, the Marine Corps has been your profession for the past 35 years, and you have served with distinction. Many aspire to be a Sergeant Major, but those who actually achieve it are few, and they must clearly demonstrate the exceptional leadership qualities we have come to expect of our senior Marines. You have reason to be proud of your most successful career. As a teacher to young Marines, 
a source of wise counsel, and as an example of these soldierly virtues that we so admire, you have made a mark on the core that will remain long after you've left our active ranks. There are many young Marines you have influenced who will carry on in the same fine tradition that has always characterized the United States Marine Corps. You have my best wishes for good health and continued success in the years ahead. Semper Fidelis, signed Eric M. Smith, General, United States Marine Corps, Commandant of the Marine Corps. Sergeant Major Porterfield also received letters of congratulations from the President George W. Bush and President Barack Obama, the 20th Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Sergeant Major Carlos Ruiz, and a small token of appreciation from the commands. All of these wonderful gifts and mementos will be on display at the reception. But ladies and gentlemen, the United States Marine Corps recognizes that our service members would not be able to succeed without the unwavering support, commitment, and understanding from their families. It is only fitting that the transition from one chapter to the next, we honor these individuals who played such a crucial role in their service member's career. At this time, we would like to recognize Mrs. Porterfield for the remarkable support she has given her husband throughout his career. Ma'am. Lieutenant General Wise will now present Mrs. Porterfield with the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Distinguished Public Service Medal. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand. Attention orders. For distinguished public service to the Department of Defense in a succession of voluntary initiatives to the service members and families of the United States Armed Forces from May 1995 to October 2024. During this period, Mrs. Porterfield's patriotism and sincere personal involvement in the welfare of service members and their families earned her profound respect from the military community. As an ambassador of goodwill and an example for military spouses, she had a significant, lasting, and positive impact on the quality of life for military families. Her presence and support throughout countless domestic and international senior leader engagements exhibited total devotion and commitment to our nations, our service members, civilians, and families. An effective advocate for the military community, she exemplified the values of patriotism, citizenship, selfless service, and personal sacrifice. The distinctive accomplishments of Mrs. Porterfield reflect great credit upon herself and the Department of Defense. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you may be seated. At this time, we invite Sergeant Major Porterfield's children to come to the stage. Letters of appreciation are being presented to Mrs. Karen Porterfield and to Staff Sergeant Calvin Albright and Jonathan Albright for the enduring support they have given to their father during his career. His sons, Gary Porterfield and Andre Cabrales, could not be with us today, but are watching virtually. We wish them well. To the Porterfield family. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Sergeant Major James K. Porterfield, United States Marine Corps, retired.
Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Water. All right. It's allergies already. All right. All right. Thank, thank you, Carl, um, for acknowledging the very distinguished list of guests joining here today. I would also like to elaborate on a few of those um, acknowledgments. First and foremost, I want to thank God for his impact on my, on my career and life. Lieutenant General Wise, sir, um, thank you for providing over today's ceremony. And thank you for trusting me enough an enlisted member to be the presiding official on your own retirement ceremony. And I want to pause there for a minute. A few years ago, Lieutenant General Wise asked me to be his presiding official for his ceremony. I, I kind of gave him a weird look, and I'm like, um, I, don't, I don't know if that's possible. <laughs> and uh, he says, no, I asked the commandant, and the commandant said, if that's who you want to be your retiring official, then, then so be it. Um, but I regret that COVID stole the opportunity from you and from me to express my pure admiration that I have for you as a dear friend. So thank you, sir. I know SEAC is, uh, he had to get on the way, but I want to thank uh, the SEAC for um, his years of friendship and support. Sergeant Major Reese, having you here today truly is, uh, means a lot to me. Um, and I'm gonna, you know, I'll darken your hatch and have dinner with you and Andrea, you know, once again, but thank you for opening your home and your, and your friendship. Lieutenant General Henry, sir, if there's anyone busier than you, I'd like to meet him. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you for being here, sir. Lieutenant General Roper and Miss Edith, thank you for uh, your friendship and uh, providing um, the words today. And that truly means a lot, sir. When I, when I asked you, you said, I, I don't even think I could finish the sentence. You said, that's something I don't even need to pray on. I'll, I'll be there. So thank you. Commodore King, Force Chief Petty Officer Ferguson, Thank you for traveling so far, so, so far um, to be here for me and, and being stalwart partners in the cooperation, cooperative defense of our nations. I'm so inspired by your transitional or transformational efforts with the Roy Bahamas Defense Force. And thank you for letting me be a part of that as you um, really develop your, um, your NCO. So, so, sir, thank you truly for being here. And Vaughn, thank, thanks for your friendship. Now. With just the smallest bit of overwhelming gratitude I feel today, expressed to everyone attending from near and far, I would like to transition into my remarks. And for those that know me well, you may be surprised that I actually have prepared notes for this special occasion. Because there is so much that I want to share briefly, I promise, and I didn't you know, want to risk the emotions of today overtaking my duty to balance my desire to acknowledge each and every person here today who has an impact on my career and my life with your ability to quite frankly stay awake. Um, but as I figuratively sail off into the sunset, hopefully with fair winds and following seas, today at my retirement ceremony, addressing a formation for the last time in uniform, active duty, I wanna talk about the rising tide of all boats and this is not just a theme for my remarks. It is a theme for my 35 plus year career. I have been buoyed, um, buoyed throughout my career and throughout my life by family, friends, colleagues, mentors, and most importantly, my gorgeous, brilliant, dynamic wife, um, Casey. This may be my retirement ceremony, but more than that, this is a moment that commemorates the professional success that was only possible due to the love, support, insight, guidance, and tremendous patience of you, Casey. For 30 years now, she's been by my side. And I may have found or stumbled my way into the Marine Corps before her, but thanks to another profoundly impressive and influential woman in my, in my life, my mom, Dolores Porterfield. My mom was my best friend and a true matriarch she helped me understand that I was better than what I was doing in my young life at that time. And through some next level parenting skills and, uh, 
she fed me to the Marine Corps recruiter. <laughs> but, uh, but it was Casey who helped me make my way to and through some of the most prestigious and professionally rewarding assignments and positions an enlisted member of the United States Marine Corps could ever be blessed with. From the drill field and DI school instructor, company first sergeant, four combat deployments, MCRD Recruit Depot San Diego, third MAW, and uh, one MEF, the Imperial MEF. The, uh, <laughs> But culminating just a few minutes ago with my change of responsibility here, relinquishing my role as a command senior enlisted leader for NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM, it was Casey's advice on the precipice of a long planned and re um, anticipated retirement that led me to my final role here. When I presented the opportunity um, to her for us to put off retirement and move to Colorado for one more assignment, her advice swayed me. She simply said and told me she still thought I had more left to give. As she, has, as she had done so many times before, she created the space for me to give more, even if it meant more time would be needed of her, more of me would be taken away from her. You see, she is my tide, lifting me up every morning with her head full of refreshed, and filled with or her head filled uh, with ideas and decisions as soon as she wakes up. Every assignment following me wherever the Marine Corps needed, every deployment, filling the gap at home, not only being an incredible mother she always is, but having to be a father too. Every promotion, every challenge, every everything. I have so much more to say about her, but I, but I have to highlight some other folks who helped lift me up. Okay. I'll come back to that. Raider Nation. Raider Nation. That's right. <laughs> All right. So let, so let me reach way back, way back to Winston and Tony. Sticking with me um, since the third grade. You know, Winston, who knows where I would be if uh, now if if that Marine Corps recruiter had not <laughs> taken you away. <laughs> you know, I truly, I love you guys. Um, Neil, Reg, and my other friend, Anton. The Marine Corps brought us together in 1989, and we've been brothers ever since, through the most challenging and rewarding times. And you know what I'm talking about. Enough said, I, I, I love you guys. Um, Lonnie, Wayne, um, Sergeant Major Lonnie Travis retired. Sergeant Major Wayne Wiggins retired. My true brothers, what more can I say? You know, iron sharpens iron, and there's no two sharper than those two. And now I want to tell you a story about another influential Marine that uh, General Wise talked about, Corporal Rowland. Corporal Rowland was the, was the influential and go-to Marine. He knew everything. No matter what the problem was, Corporal Rowland could fix it. I wanted to be just like him. I followed him around. I worked hard, I, you know, wherever he was troubleshooting, I was there. But, but hard work and even subject matter expertise can only get you so far. What I learned from Corporal Roland was that I didn't, want to be, I didn't want to be the best. I didn't want to be like Corporal Roland, a rising star. What I really wanted was to be part of a team full of Corporal Rolands. I wanted to help my fellow Marines build their own talent and expertise so that we could all be counted on to fix whatever problem came up, so, so that we could all rise. Even without even knowing it, at that time, this became the foundation of my leadership ethos. I never set out to be a rising star. I just wanted to do everything I could to raise the tide or rise the tide of my fellow Marines, soldiers, airmen, guardians, and to do that, I had to be the best I could be, which meant learning and mastering my own duties. As a young Marine growing up in aviation, I didn't have a formal mentor, per se. Then I went to the drill field as a young staff sergeant and met Sergeant Major Carlton Kent, who for, reason only, and for reasons only he knows, showed a special interest in me and became my first mentor. He pushed me to reach my potential 
and more potential than I even thought I had. And he has taught me so much. One lasting and important lesson I learned from him um, was the value of a phone call over an email. And I think many of you know that uh, you don't get a lot of emails from me. I'd rather call. And that no matter how busy your duties and your responsibilities make you, you should always never be busy or too busy for your people. For the last 26 years in counting, he's been my mentor. So thank you for never being too busy for me. Another friend and mentor I have to talk about is Sergeant Major Hall retired. You know, um, it was impossible for me, just about everyone to meet you, to avoid your gravitational pull. Um, you remember everything and, and you know everyone. And, and I am so much better off, you know, having you, known you for so long. Uh, so where do I even start? In, two, in 2004, when two first sergeants got stationed together, we just clicked. And he's been a confidant from everything life has thrown at me. From, from quoting Shaft during deployments, <laughs> um, and having our virtual sip and burns with Chip, um, to showing up at my mom's funeral. Something that was so unexpected and, uh, and truly meant the world to me. And even having you as the best travel guide ever for Casey's 50th birthday in Jamaica. <laughs> uh, thank you for your friendship and your brotherhood. And we'll be back to Jamaica as we all know. And speaking of brotherhood, uh, my, my brother, my big brother, my, the best brother, my first mentor, my hero, Mr. Wyoming, um, you were always there for me mentally, physically, emotionally. From the, from the little things as far as I can be remember, I think I was probably seven or eight years old and uh, I, would get these, I would get cramps in my legs throughout the night and I would call my brother and he would come running into my room. He would massage my leg without even asking and make sure I was all right and, and could go back to sleep. You know, to, to the big things like, like having my back in the neighborhood and, uh, and a couple months ago, this, this man, he witnessed a car accident literally right in front of him. So without regard for his own safety, he literally ran to the car and, and, and ripped the door off this car and, and to rescue somebody inside. So you, you truly are a superhero, always looking out for others, um, except maybe in the middle of competition. <laughs> I love you, bro. So, so let me wrap this up where I started, back to Casey and my family. For a long time now, our family has been living for the core. And most recently, the men and women of, who are defending our homelands. But looking ahead to what, you know, what is next, there's only thing I wanna be living for from here on out, and I promise to say it, not sing it, you know, because living, living for the love of you is, is, is my song. Of, I want to be living for the love of you, for the love of you, Casey, and for the love of our beautiful family. You know, my sons, Gary, Calvin, Jonathan, and Andre, in the company of some of the most dear friends and remarkable mentors and colleagues, without hesitation, you are the most important men in my life. You are my proudest accomplishment. More than any medal, more than any assignment, or any promotion. I, I, I love you guys. So during my own childhood, I, I saw how my father had to sacrifice throughout his military career to do what was best for the family. And I also saw how much more wives and mothers had to do to fill the gaps in military service creates. I'm so grateful to my own father for everything he did and for all the things he couldn't do during his geo bachelor tours. I'm so grateful to the mothers of my boys for the men that you've grown into. And thanks to their guiding hands, 
It fills my heart with so much joy. The fathers that you are to your children, my grandchildren, is, is a testament to the men that, that you are. So as I make this incredibly bittersweet transition, I have some final words of wisdom that I'd like to share. My contribution in uniform, at least to, to lifting the tide. Now these words are not my own. There are words that I borrowed from Ronald Reagan. And if you've been in my office or my former office, you would have seen a small plaque. But it reads, words that I've tried to live by and that have kept me humble, allowed me to serve and stay focused on lifting the tide throughout my career. But I would ask that you please allow me a bit of grace to make one small modification to be more inclusive and honor the women who have been an important in my life and career who I've served alongside. But, it's, but it reads, there is no limit to what a man or woman can do or where he or she can go if they don't mind who gets the credit. The credit of my career does not go to me. It goes to my family, my friends, my mentors, my colleagues, to all of you here today that I have truly had the honor and privilege of serving alongside. So thank you. Godspeed and Semper Fidelis. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be seated. At this time, members of NORA and U.S. NORTHCOM will conduct a flag folding ceremony in honor of Sergeant Major Porterfield's 35 years of faithful service to his country. This longstanding military tradition pays respect to this iconic symbol of American identity and national pride is very fitting on Flag Day. For more than 200 years, the American flag has been the symbol of our nation's unity, as well as a source of pride and inspiration for millions of citizens. Born today, 14 June in 1777, the Second Continental Congress determined that the flag of the United States will be 13 stripes, alternating between seven red and six white, and that the Union be 13 stars, white in a blue field, representing a new constellation. Between 1777 and 1960, the shape and design of the flag evolved into the flag presented before you today. The 13 horizontal stripes represent the original 13 colonies, while the stars represent the 50 states of the Union. The colors of the flag are symbolic as well. Red symbolizes hardiness and valor. White signifies purity and innocence. And blue represents vigilance, perseverance, justice. Traditionally a symbol of liberty, the American flag has carried the message of freedom and inspired Americans both home and abroad. Today, our flag flies on constellations of satellites that encircle our globe and on Marine Corps installations and forward operating bases around the world. Indeed, it flies in the heart of every service member who serves our great nation. The sun never sets on the military, nor on the flag we so proudly cherish. Since 1776, no generation of Americans has been spared the responsibility of defending freedom. Today's military members remain committed to preserving the freedom that others want for us for generations to come. By displaying the flag and giving it a distinct fold, we show respect to the flag and express our gratitude to those individuals who fought and continue to fight for freedom at home and abroad. Since the dawn of the 20th century, military members have proudly flown the flag in every major conflict on land and skies around the world. It is their responsibility, yea, our responsibility, to continue to protect and preserve the rights, privileges, and freedoms that we, as Americans, enjoy today. The United States flag represents 
who we are. It stands for the freedom we all share and the pride and patriotism we feel for our country. We cherish its legacy as a beacon of hope to one and all. Long may it wave.